two minutes. Welcome, Emperor. It's the microphone's fault. Hello. Yeah. Welcome, Margaret, everybody. It's my pleasure as president to welcome you to this evening's lecture. The lecture this evening will need very little introduction to many of you, and probably most of you. It's Dr. Fred Starr, who we have to thank for, with Jonathan, organising the very successful Teesside meeting. Fred comes from Teesside, which is why the meeting was there, and but he moved to London after graduating in 1966. Much of his working life was spent at the British Gas at London Research Station, a newly built facility on Fulham Gasworks. Initially employed as a failure investigator on steam reforming plants, he became responsible for developing materials to resist high temperature corrosion in advanced gas making environments, where feedstock was heavy oil. The challenge was quite different to those being experienced in other areas of high temperature corrosion. It meant investigating unusual materials and setting up a coherent set of research programs with manufacturers and universities. All work on gas making was stopped in the early 80s, but Fred was encouraged by his assistant director at London Research to come up with fresh ideas on how to use natural gas. The result was a closed cycle gas turbine and sterling engine projects, both of which relied on high temperature alloys. Neither of these would have been conceived or brought to fruition without a good knowledge of the history of technology. After leaving British Gas in 1966, Fred, 1996, Fred worked for a number of organisations, the most important being that of EU's research centre in the Netherlands, where he was technical leader on a project to produce hydrogen from coal, storing the carbon dioxide in spent oil and gas fields. On his return to London in 2007, Fred was an active member, or became an active member of the Newcomb Society. It was he who suggested and then helped organise the conference on the piston engine revolution and that on the World War I swords into plowshares. Being more retiring than you think, he wants to acknowledge the long-standing and tremendous support and encouragement he has had from Eddie Marshall and Brian Walton, who he refers to cronies in the best sense of the word. So, without more ado, I'd like to ask Fred to give his presentation. Thanks, Fred. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. You can see the title here, Oxidation of Metals. Impact on technological development, past and present. Perhaps it's one of the <clears throat> few industrial history uh, subjects which impacts on the present day. Now, a lot of people, when <coughs> they heard I was uh, going to talk about oxidation, thought I'm talking about rust. I'm not. I'm talking about a phenomena that goes on at high temperature. And uh, it was actually. Uh, the man who invented the Stirling engine, the Reverend Robert Stirling engine, who actually first used oxidation, as me and my colleagues would uh, refer to it, um, that is the phenomena caused, that causes the degradation of metals at high temperature. There's no water involved, it's a high temperature process. And, um, what I'll be continually emphasising during this meeting is that oxidation and high temperature corrosion are barriers to progress today. And as it happens, I was just reading the Telegraph on uh, Saturday, and it, uh, they are saying that because of a high temperature corrosion problem that Rolls Royce are experiencing with their uh, Trent jet engine, they're going to have to fork out over $500 million to get it right. That came about, in my view, because they thought they could get away with the material which wasn't quite good enough in terms of resisting the conditions that you've got in their modern jet engine. Now here's the uh, outline of the talk, and uh, you might be surprised to see that I'm going to talk about the transporter bridge. What's that got to do with oxidation? I'm going to be talking again about how it limits progress today, some of the problems it's caused in the uh, nearby past, particularly Britain's nuclear reactors. Then we go back to the Industrial Revolution, Stirling engines and uh, Nielsen's hot blast stove, and steam engines and boilers. And then I'm going to go to something which uh, annoys me a bit, 
when people used to talk about the uh, way that metals were first extracted, they said, some people in the Newcomen Society say that, oh, it's all to do with the melting point, and the, uh, the first metals to be extracted were those with the low melting point. It's nothing to do with that. It's a thing called free energy. And finally, we return to Middlesbrough. Now, uh, this is what uh, some of us were fortunate to see um, in the summer, the visit to the transported bridge. And believe you me, that the whole point about going to Teesside was to get the trip up to the top of the transported bridge and to use the lift. And the lift was very unreliable, but eventually they got it to work. But until a couple of days before our visit in the summer, it looked like it had gone west again. And here is the uh, crowd of us outside of the, they've just been on the gondola across the River Tees, and they're wondering, can we get to the top? Is the lift uh, working? It's a long way to climb. Here is the uh, lift at the top, and here are the uh, fitters. Now, that lift is driven to the top by electric motors, of course. Now, what happens on the way down? Well, the electric motors work as generators, and they break the progress of the lift back to the bottom. And they're generating electricity, and that's got to be dissipated somehow. And it was dissipated in these resistance heaters. And here is uh, Brian Dobbs, the, one of the fitters that uh, I got to know uh, literally the day that before we came up. And he showed me what had gone wrong. And those resistant heaters had burnt out in the middle. And they burnt out because of high temperature oxidation. And this is what we're talking about when things go wrong oxidation-wise. The metal here, there is a metal center here, a tube, uh, just like the uh, resistance heaters in, in your um, electric stoves at home, getting heated up by the uh, electricity going through. This was being pushed to too high a rate, and sort of temperatures it was reaching there, 1100 C, that's really about two or three hundred degrees hotter than it should do. I can also uh, get a, an estimate of what was going on from the temperature of the fins. Temperatures up to 700 C. What happens is, is that a nice thin oxide film, which is maybe a tenth of a millimeter thick, if you push it up maybe even a hundred degrees above the design temperature, you get this kind of mess. And that's uh, the kind of thing that might have been occurring in the Rolls-Royce jet engines I was just talking about. Now, if you look at the world today, all of these things like coal-fired car plants, the newer gas fuel combined cycle gas turbine plants, here we've got a waste incineration plant this is on the borders of Croydon and Sutton, just set up. Jet transport aircraft, they're all limited by high temperature corrosion. There are loads of materials, believe you me, that can go up to, in terms of temperature strength far beyond the materials that we're, we have to use nowadays. But we simply can't use them because their oxidation rate is too high. So we have to use things like stainless steel and nickel-based alloys and do the very best that we can to push up the oxidation performance. And unfortunately, if you try and do that too much, you wreck the strength of these materials. Well, oxidation in all of our lifetimes has led to the wrecking of Britain's uh, advance of uh, 
our uh, nuclear program. This is why we're going cap in hand to the Chinese and the French to get uh, nuclear reactors built in this country. And Britain had a very, very good program uh, in terms of its gas filled reactors. It goes back to the very first um, way that they were producing plutonium over a wind scale. But Calder Hall was the very first plant running at uh, 310 C steam temperature, 14 bar steam pressure. Uh, the next step was a more commercial design, Wilfer. That has only just shut down last year after about 40 years operation. And we come to the advanced gas filled reactors. All of these were taking the heat away from the nuclear reactor and passing it through the system where it was used to boil water and superheat water to produce steam that went through steam turbines. And the problem came about after they'd been running these things for a few years that they came up with a, a problem called breakaway corrosion emerged. That is where the corrosion is going on at a nice low level for many, for, for a number of years, and then it just shoots up, and you can't do anything about it. All you can do is resume, reduce the operating temperature of the system, and when you start to do that, you're making the whole thing uneconomic. This is breakaway corrosion in a very schematic way. This might be three or four years after you've been running the system. And this is what it actually looks like. Here you've got a thin tube here. These are the tube fins here, and here, and here. That's the light grey. And the, this stuff here is the oxide which is forming. You can obviously see the bits of oxide are falling off. They're going heaven knows where inside of the nuclear reactor, possibly jamming control rods and so forth. It's not a good situation. There isn't really a solution, and that's why the advanced gas club reactor program closed down after so much money was spent on it. Now we have similar problems with uh, similar corrosion problems even with our coal fire pass station. Here we have a schematic of a pass station. This is the boiler here. Uh, pulverized fuel is being, coal is being injected. It's heating tubes along the walls of this boiler. The boiler inside would be maybe about twice the size of this room, completely covered with tubes full of uh, water at a pressure of maybe uh, 180 bar. The steam which is produced goes into the steam drum at the top there, that's a round uh, thing at the top. It then goes into the superheater and it's heated up even more to something like today, something like about 560, 560 steam temperature. Both the boiler tubes and the superheaters are badly affected by corrosion. And again, we're having to live with that. Here is the uh, inside of the boiler, and you get an idea of the number of tubes which, are, which you've got. And that's what's actually happening to the tube. It hasn't burst through high pressure steam or anything. Look at the top and compare it with the bottom. That's how much of the tube has been wasted by this high temperature corrosion that's been going on. We don't really have a solution. Similarly with the superheaters, we have the same sort of phenomena there going on, slightly different mechanism, but this is the bottom of what is called a superheater bank. 
the steam is coming down here, flowing up here, and going back to the steam turbines. Notice that if anything were to drop down this tube, it would stop there, and it would start to block the steam flow. And if you block the steam flow, the steam the tube overheats. That's uh, what the uh, things look like in service. You have corrosion by SO2, HCl, CO and sodium salts. The problem that we have with British coal, coals is that we've got a lot of chlorine in the coals which causes additional problems. But what's going on, this is the new phenomenon we're coming across. What's going on inside is that the steam itself, which you would think would be fairly innocuous, is attacking the metal. And although you get a very thin layer of oxide, that oxide breaks off. And it's falling, forming all these little bits of material which, if they fell down into the bottom of those superheaters, they would block the tubing and the whole thing would overheat. Now maybe the steam velocity is high enough to carry these bits through the system. Well, what then happens? Sorry. Here's your turbine blades yeah. getting eroded away. <coughs> yeah. And we then pass to gas turbines and the kind of problem that Rolls-Royce are experiencing here is a new gas turbine blade, looks very nice. This is what happens to it after it's been in service for a, a, few, a few thousand hours or so, or being overheated. The whole thing starts to get in a hell of a mess due to high temperature corrosion. This is why gas turbines aren't used on ships. The salt in the air causes the most enormous corrosion problems of the blade. Well, we're now up to the Industrial Revolution. You saw the Stirling engine at the start, and I mentioned that the Reverend Stirling said his biggest problem was with high temperature oxidation. But the, the Stirling engine was actually the most efficient means of generating power in the Industrial Revolution, certainly up to about 1850. And here we have um, a cross-section through a double-acting Stirling engine at Dundee. You've got these, you've got these uh, the sort of vessels of this sort of shape, and inside of here you've got these dumbbells which are running up and down. And what they're doing is that they're allowing air to be heated and uh, to expand increasing pressure. That is then communicated over to the piston here. The whole thing works on that double, double active principle. And the heat for the process is just coming from a standard coal fire. <coughs> The problem was that they only had cast iron and raw iron in those days, much inferior to stainless steel. Temperature limit here would be maybe about 300 C, and you can't get a uh, lot of power without wasting the system, so the whole lot of scrap. Similarly, with the uh, Nielsen uh, hot glass stove. Uh, this is basically a long heat exchanger in which the cross section of each, each tube in here looks like that. We've got a fire down here, which is uh, the combustion products are going up the chimney to the stack. We've got cold air coming in here, <coughs> going through here, getting heated, and the stove, the, sorry, I should have said that the, uh, the hot air is going off to a blast furnace. 
And this uh, technique of heating the air to the blast furnace, it, it increased productivity by about 50%. It's the biggest, it was the biggest single development in blast furnace technology. And the Nielsen stove was a great breakthrough. But the problem was that once again, because you just had got cast iron and wrought iron to play with, your blast temperatures were limited to just over 400 degrees. In the 1860s, when people could see that you couldn't do anything more with the, the, this type of stove, they introduced a thing called the uh, Whitwell stove and Kelper stove, which rely on refractories. And that technology today is getting blast for temperatures up to 1300 degrees, way beyond metals. Well, we all like to pride ourselves on the knowledge of steam engines and how wonderful they are. But believe you me, we are really quite lucky. It's just that God was on our side because um, and, and I'm going back to our Darlington pumping station. When producing steam, the boilers survive because there is a protective form of oxidation going on. The boilers don't rust inside, as you might think. This is the uh, Darlington pumping station again. Here is our group of people here. I think that's uh, Julia down there. Various other people you might recognize. And what is happening in the boilers is that the, air, the, the water that comes into the boilers is uh, quickly driven off once the water boils. And then the water reacts with the steam to form magnetite. And that magnetite is less than a tenth of a millimeter. And it adheres very, very well to the inside of the boiler. And it stops any further reactions. And if this didn't happen, we wouldn't have had an industrial revolution. We have a similar situation today. Battersea Power Station, uh, this is Drax, uh, our, our most efficient uh, power station, which I believe is now running on biomass. Uh, Haysham, nuclear reactors, and even the uh, combined cycle gas turbine plants, they all use uh, steam. The old boil water makes steam at high pressure. And every power station in the world relies on that, that micro, uh, micrometer thickness of magnetite. But as temp uh, pressures are going up, this is becoming harder to sustain. So that's the first half of the talk, really. Just to kind of keep this message to you. So in the uh, Industrial Revolution, that was made possible by the formation of a very thin layer of oxide magnetite. Today, our civilization depends on chromium because the superheater alloys, where we can get the high temperature steam, use. Uh, rely on chromium. And jet engines rely on a combination of chromium and aluminium. Uh, if you look at that Rolls-Royce alloy, which is being used in the Trent, it is really quite marginal, in my view. Not enough chromium. Certainly not enough chromium. And really, I think the aluminium level is quite low. If you try and push up the chromium and aluminium contents, it weakens the, uh, uh, these materials. You get the wrong kind of uh, phases, as they're called, or it will cause enrichment. Now we come to the uh, second half of the talk. 
in which uh, trying to get over this uh, view that uh, it's the melting point of metals which is significant in the way that they came to be uh, discovered. This is a simple um, crucible furnace for um, making uh, copper out of copper oxide. You've got bellows up here which are forcing air into the uh, into this arrangement here, which is full of charcoal. We've got a little crucible here. And uh, that's how you're making the material. This is the order in which metals were discovered. Lead, 9000 BC. Copper, well, that's got a very low melting point, as we all know. Copper is uh, kind of like intermediate melting point, just over a thousand degrees. That came later, so that makes sense. But then we've got tin, which melts lower than copper, lower than lead. Didn't come along until 1750, and iron was just 250 years later. And then zinc, which has got a melting point not much more than lead. It wasn't produced in elemental form until really modeled at the end of the Renaissance. Just to give you an idea of the kind of temperatures that we're talking about, here is uh, copper being made in that crucible I just showed you. Melting point of copper, 1093. This looks quite sensible. But here we've got Tin, 232 melting point. Why is it coming out of the label so hot? And here we have the melting point of uh, <coughs> common metals. Put them in order, and you see tin of lead about the same, zinc in between, but aluminium, really quite a low melting point. Why did that take such a long time to be produced? Well, it's a thing called free energy, uh, not melting point, which is the uh, limitation. Now, this is the hard part of the lecture, I'm afraid. Um, I have to start telling you a bit of, bit of basic science. Everybody knows the reaction Hydrogen plus oxygen gives you steam. But, and we all know that that reaction occurs very easily, but if you would heat up hydrogen and oxygen to 4,500 degrees, they simply would not combine. The molecules are flying around at such a high rate that when they come into contact, they just bounce apart. And we have a, uh, okay. yes, we have a, a uh, we, we can write this reaction in terms of a thing called free energy. It's not, it's not entropy, and it's not the amount of heat that produces, that's being produced in the reaction, which is the key thing. It's free energy, and you get that reaction by the amount of being heat being produced, the entropy change between the, the uh, products and the reactants, and the temperature. Just across the road in Imperial College, this diagram was produced in the wall. And it's the most important diagram in terms of metal smelting. What this is showing is that for every oxide, as the temperature goes up, the oxide becomes more unstable. When free energy reaches zero, that, that oxide will decompose. <coughs> um, another way of showing this is that we have our friend water here, which I just talked about, that if you took water to 4,500 degrees, it would decompose into hydrogen and oxygen. 
lead oxide decomposes quite easily. Note that tin oxide is quite hard to decompose, actually as hard as copper. Iron is pretty difficult, and aluminium, you'd have to take the temperature to something like about six or 7,000 degrees before you could decompose it. This is another way of showing it on the diagram. Now, I've talked about free energy. I like to try and bring things back to reality. And you can sort of show free energy at work with the Newcomen engine. How many of us here know how the Newcomen engine works? Can you put your hands up, please? Right, about half of you. They mean, so why are you here at the Newcomen facility? <laughs> Well, you have a cylinder here. This is the start of the process, which is filled with steam at 100 degrees. It just comes off a normal boiler, and it fills up the cylinder, and it drives this piston right to the top of the cylinder. Now, if I cool down the cylinder by injecting water, <coughs> The steam condensers, you've got virtually a vacuum here, and the atmospheric pressure forces the piston down. That's where your work is coming from in the Newcomen engine. This is effectively your seeing free energy being displayed. And the steam appears as condensed water. It's your water now. Now, Let's go back to uh, our oxides. I'll try to keep this uh, realistic. Supposing we had a wonderful cylinder that could withstand 3,000 degrees, and we could heat that up, and we put lead and oxygen inside of that cylinder. Well, again, as I was talking about in terms of water, if you get the temperature high enough, everything will decompose. So what we're showing here is a mixture of uh, lead particles and oxygen. Now I cool down the cylinder, the lead and the oxygen combine. Lead oxide is produced. It's used up all the oxygen in the cylinder. And so the pressure is now very low, and the piston comes down. Exactly the same as with the nuclear engine. So you can now go away and write papers on the thermodynamics of the nuclear engine. In practice, we don't get metals by heating the oxides up to a high temperature. We always do it by reacting them with carbon. And again, God is on our side. Although most of the lines that I showed in the diagram show that as the temperature goes up, oxides become more unstable. There is one oxide where it doesn't go, and that is when carbon reacts with uh, oxygen to make carbon monoxide. And I don't want to go into the thermodynamics in too great a detail, but wherever this line crosses the metal oxide line, that's the point at which the oxide will be reduced. So that's just emphasizing it again. Carbon will only reduce the oxide when the carbon monoxide line falls below the oxide. Once again, we can set out this diagram. This is the theoretical smelting temperatures that we get with various metals. Copper is actually quite unstable, and you could, if you waited long enough, you'll be able to produce it at almost room temperature. In practice, you push the temperature up to get the reaction going 
fast but again you see that this 10 is hard to hard to produce even by smelting almost as difficult as iron that explains why it was a very short it took a long time to produce tin and then not very much longer before iron was produced and then zinc is quite difficult and it didn't come out until the uh, until uh, during the renaissance just summarizing it again copper is very easy tin but as difficult as iron zinc is a borderline possibility we now return to Teesside, and this is the view of, if you'd gone to Teesside in something like about 1890, and you'd stood on the uh, furnaces on the north side of the river, and looked upriver, um, uh, just about, just towards the top of the picture, below the K, that is where the transporter bridge was going to be produced, uh, was going to be built. And even, even in the uh, 19th century, Teesside was the, in the 19th century, Teesside was the biggest iron make making centre in the world. And it all came about because of free energy. And it all happened very quickly because the local ores from the Cleveland Hills, the iron ores, contain quite a lot of phosphorus. And it's impossible to make good quality iron, raw iron, if you've got a lot of phosphorus there. Now, uh, a new technique had come around in the 1780s, the uh, dry puddling process, but that couldn't handle the kind of ores that they got on to the side. By 1730, wet puddling had been developed in the Midlands, and it turned out, and, and that was uh, being used basically to speed up the process. But they found that the wet handling process, which utilised magnetite containing materials, we're back to our friend magnetite again, that that was able to react with the phosphorus in molten pig iron. And it's the free energy changes connected with this, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail, which show um, enable this to happen. Here we have a picture of a puddling furnace. It's uh, an enclosure maybe from about here to the back of the room and perhaps about the width of this set of seats here. And here is uh, one of the uh, founders pulling one of the, uh, the balls out of the furnace. This is a slightly clearer view. It's um, models in the, uh, from the Munich Museum. Here is the guy pulling a ball, a wrought iron ball, out of the furnace. It will then be subsequently worked and turned into rails and plates. That's what the, uh, the ball looks like when it comes out. Uh, this is what it's like if you were uh, if you allowed it to cool down to room temperature, here we have the puddling furnace. Here you start off with molten pig iron. Here you put pegs of pig iron in. You have fire going here. The fire has uh, got a lot of excess air on it. It heats up the pig iron, melts it and the iron reacts with the carbon and the silicon in the iron to purify it. That's uh, effectively the dry puddling process. Pig iron starts off with 
all of these funny spidery looking things which are really pieces of graphite, flakes of graphite which have been sectioned. The graphite makes the iron very, very brittle because cracks run along through the iron, through the, the flakes, and that's why the cast iron is very brittle. But at the end of the process, you come up with raw time, you've got rid of all the carbon. This black stuff looks bad, but it's pretty innocuous. It's just uh, layers of slab. But you can't use that because the uh, wet dry puddling process because you just oxidize too much of the iron. What we do, what they did with dry wet puddling is that they made the sides of the enclosure out of material called uh, bulldog or blue billy. These are effectively refractory materials containing a lot of magnetite. We start off the process by filling the uh, bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, system with uh, scrap iron. You heat it up. That turns into magnetite. And then during the process, the magnetite reacts with the, uh, <coughs> the carbon, silicon, and phosphorus in the iron. You can explain all of this in terms of free energy. You've had too much of that. So all comes down to the fact that magnetite is less st stable than phosphorus pentoxide. Well, we are now at the end. These are the conclusions that oxides and the oxidation of metals have shaped technical pro progress. They're still shaping it. Free energy, not melting point, going successful smelting. The Industrial Revolution depended on its boilers being protected by a very thin layer of magnetite. And some technologies like the Nielsen Poplar stove and the Stirling engine had a very short existence because it just didn't have stainless steel at the time. And in the modern era, Oxidation wrecked the British approach to nuclear power, and it also killed off something I worked on, the European and American coal gasification programs, because the corrosion problems in those reactors were so intense. But today, high temperature corrosion is limiting power generation and aircraft engine technology. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Fred. That was a fascinating lecture about a lot of things I never knew existed or had an effect on, certainly smelting and higher you know, jet engine technology. So it was very fascinating. It's the sort of topic that we love to have at the Newfoundland that brings us really to some new aspect of technology. So, are there any other questions, Fred? I'm sure there will be. Jonathan? Yes. Uh, you spoke about the change to copper stoves with glass furnaces. Yes. Um, they have another problem in modern copper stoves, which is stress corrosion and cracking. So, what's the relation between this oxidization protection? and stress corrosion cracking, where presumably that protection breaks down and you get other corrosion mechanisms. I bow to your greater knowledge, Jonathan. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't quite know. Are you talking about the cracking of the bricks? The stone domes are, are made of steel. Stone domes are made of steel, and in the moist atmosphere, they, you get an acidic deposition, which exploits the gaps between the, uh, the crystals and breaks down the crystalline structure. Now, presumably, the story you're telling is that that stone dome should be protected by a level of oxide. Uh, well, that's, that's really quite interesting, and it goes back to a problem that we had in British gas in the 1960s. Fortunately, 
Um, we started supplying natural gas rather than town's gas. But um, it was becoming apparent that carbon monoxide could cause stress corrosion. And it is quite possible that in these stoves you've got carbon monoxide sure. coming through. And that yes. is uh, part of the problem. Now, um, another aspect to this is the choice of your steel. If you decide to be clever and try and reduce the weight of the uh, camper stove by going to higher tensile strength steels, you're much more likely to run into this phenomenon. And whether it is the carbon monoxide or whether it the carbon monoxide and moisture then results in hydrogen and brittlement is a moot point. But I like questions like this because I know what to do with the rest of my week. <laughs> <laughs> I could ask a follow-up to this. So yes. You didn't mention titanium. And as I understand it, the plans for superheated boilers are to switch from steel to titanium in order to overcome the problems you spoke about. I hope to God not. not. Uh, titanium has been the, uh, the biggest disappointment to high temperature metallurgists. Um, it's got a melting point of something like 1660 degrees. And you would think on that basis it would be at least as good as iron or nickel. In actual fact, and it's, it's obviously tied in with the, uh, the actual um, structure of the uh, structure of titanium, that it's about as strong as mild steel and mild steel starts to give out at around about 500 degrees. But there is another pro there are two other problems with titanium, both of which are connected with oxidation. The oxide that it forms doesn't have the properties of magnetite or chromia or aluminum. It lets oxygen stream through and as a result the oxide scale grows quite quickly. But as well as that, the oxygen then goes into the metal itself and causes it to embrittle. Now, um, titanium is very good in the right place. It's good for condenser tubes where you want good um, aqueous corrosion resistance and the temperature is not very high but in terms of high temperature strength it's 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 really quite limited thank you Fred for an excellent talk um, you reminded me that I used to set exam questions on free energy and um, <clears throat> I didn't realise it was important as it was, <laughs> and certainly my students didn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, my, my question really is, is uh, nothing to do with that, it's just that um, I seem to remember from my youth something called surnets, ceramic metals, and I wondered um, if this was at all relevant. I'm sorry I can't help but laugh. Uh, I think if you go back to the birth of the, uh, the jet, jet engine, uh, people have been talking about ceramics in some form or other. Now, uh, what Brian, I think, is talking about is a co kind of a composite of a, a metal and a ceramic. The problems with ceramics is that they, they're really quite brittle. And um, if you have a jet engine, and a bird flies through the aircraft, you're not going to have much of a turbine. Um, but I was also intrigued to see that um, Rolls-Royce, in this effort to push up the performance of um, 
the uh, Rolls-Royce Trent are looking at silicon carbide uh, fiber, fiber strength and materials. Now, I, I was telling people about 30 years ago that one of the big problems of silicon carbide is that it doesn't like steam. And when you burn um, uh, uh, kerosene, particularly in high pressure, as you are in a jet engine, where the modern jet engines are running at something like 40 bar uh, pressure in the combustion system, the partial pressure of the steam that's produced is quite high. So you've got a combination, lethal combination of uh, temperature, steam, and silicon carbide. Now I shouldn't tell you this, but I write a sardonic column for materials work. And in the next issue, which is coming out, you'll see an amazing picture of what steam can do to silicon carbide. It turns a nice solid crystal of silicon carbide into something that looks like mica, flaking and pump. I don't know what the mechanism is. Nobody else has noticed it because we didn't publish our test, the test that we were doing down when I was back at um, London Research Station in Fulham. We just didn't tell anybody what we were doing. But now I don't think anybody is going to uh, get, get, get me for publishing the secrets of British gas. And that's one of the secrets that steam, high pressure steam, doesn't generally like ceramic materials, particularly silicon carbon. And you might say that every six or seven years, people come along with the new wonder ceramic. And it, it lasts for maybe the attention lasts for three or four years, and then it uh, disappears. Yeah. And then people then start again. Thank you. Yeah, hello, Frank. I've read articles that you've written about uh, valves in petrol engines and diesel engines. I know if you didn't mention the fact of those, because they're, they're metals working at high temperature and pressures. You didn't mention in your car lecture. Uh, well, it's, it's more fun to talk about the disasters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's more fun to talk about the disasters than the successes. Um, but you are quite right. Um, I mean, I, I think I ran over time uh, today. And I couldn't put in the petrol engines. But um, that's, you're making a very good point. And if you look at the papers that I've written, the first attempt to act, apart from making um, resistance alloys for um, Toasters. That was the first attempt to make good oxidation resistant alloys. The first attempt to make something which was a, a mechanical nature, an engineering nature, was the, um, was the, were the valves in uh, piston engines. And it was the Americans that did it. They came up with a uh, material called silkrome, which um, was used uh, with valve cooling in the, uh, the Lindbergh flight across the States. And that material is still used for the inlet valves in most car engines. It's, it's not got superhuman strength, um, and it's not got superhuman oxidation resistance. But the combination of silicon and carbon is, is a very, sorry, silicon and chromium is a very nice combination to give you good resistance up to something like that, 750C. Yeah. Uh, someone mentioned titanium being, a, and you've mentioned it being a high temperature, but it breaks down with oxygen, as I understand. Oxygen breaks it down somehow. 
Yeah, um, yeah. basically what's happening, uh, Charles, is, is that the oxygen diffuses into the material and it then embrittles it. It stops the uh, things called dislocations in the material moving around very easily. The, the oxygen is also another as was a, another problem in the uh, in the manufacture of the material. You have to produce the material under very very high vacuum con conditions. If, if there was any oxygen around at all, that material was going to be absolutely useless. Can it be used in a spacecraft a vacuum? Because Oh, no doubt there's atoms drifting, although it's a vacuum in space, I imagine there's still a few atoms drifting around. Well, or would it gradually well, deteriorate? Well, exactly. I mean, um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, problems which they found in spacecraft is that although um, you've got virtually a vacuum in space, and we're talking about near, you know, 500 miles up and thereabouts, there's still atoms of oxygen, nitrogen, hanging around. And thermodynamically, they should not react with the material. But here you've got your spacecraft flying along at uh, five miles per second. And there's your little oxygen atom. Bang! The oxygen then sticks onto the material and it started to degrade it. So that was a very good question there. I didn't think anybody would. Uh, and the other thing is, if you can, if it does, if it uh, oxygen atom stick, could you use titanium as an oxygen filter to filter out oxygen out of the gas? Oh yes, yes. I mean, when you're making some of these uh, coatings, you put titanium into the processing atmosphere, and that titanium grabs any uh, oxygen or nitrogen that you've got, and you can get uh, a much better material. The, the titanium absorbs the oxygen. Do you have to obtain your alloys that can overcome the problem? No. No. There aren't. Um, what about these carbon fibre? Could you coat it in carbon fibre? Uh, I have. You're, you're getting beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> right. I give up. <laughs> When, when these problems were first recognised, they obviously weren't described, they obviously weren't described as high temperature corrosion. Um, how did the people at the time describe the problem? Well, and, they had, and, um, as always, I, I assume that they overcame them practically before they could describe them theoretically. Well, that's absolutely right. Um, I, I do like to show that slide and that quote from the Reverend Stone because he was the first man to use oxidation as people started to use the term from about 1900 onwards. Before that time, they would talk about wastage, wastage of the metal. And um, they'd be looking at things on a pretty macro scale, whereby, um, you remember the picture I showed you of the, uh, the failed heater? Well, that's when oxidation really hits you in the eye and you know that something is going wrong. And that is obviously wastage. Well, I think that people only began to really look into the subject in the 1920s. And when I was at university, I found it very difficult to follow what was being talked about. And the reason was is that we just didn't have the techniques 
for analyzing the layers of scale that could develop. It was with the uh, development of the scanning electron microscope and the microprobe that you could find out the elemental composition of each of these layers. And believe you me, this was an absolute revelation at the time. It just started, it meant that a lot of things whereby all you could do was record the weight changes and so forth in different atmospheres without properly understanding what was going on. You now had got very good techniques and since I've left the business, the techniques have got even more sophisticated. So would it be correct to say that up to that point, um, solving the problem was really a matter of trial and error? In other words, how did people have, what signposts were there for people to, 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 to choose different materials that wouldn't have posed that problem? Well, I think, I think uh, yeah, Jonathan said, are you going to say anything about stainless steel? Well, I, I, stainless steels were invented around about uh, 19, 1906, something like that. <coughs> well, what would become very, very apparent very, very quickly is that these materials not only had got good resistance to rusting, but when they were heated up in the furnace, that the scales that were formed were really quite thin. And so you start to put two and two together that if you added enough chromium to the alloy, you'd get a better oxidation resistance. And you have to add enough. You need about 12% chromium to give you good oxidation resistance. If I can have a slide at Rolls-Royce again, this super alloy that they're using in the trend has got 2% chromium. Similarly with um, aluminium, when that was added, if you add something like about uh, 8 or 9%, you can have uh, reasonable resistance. But it was all quite empirical. Me or Dick? No, thanks. <laughs> okay. Good, good morning. Oh, you, just, you just reminded me when I was a research student in the 19, 50 years ago, and I was actually studying its fundamental process in corrosion. I was one of the first to use the scanning electron microscope, which had just been developed in Cambridge mm -hmm. Engineering Labs, to study corrosion. And the paper got thrown out by physics review letters who said, you know, this is ridiculous. Cause we, exposed this extraordinary morphology of films that pe people thought were just flat and compact and they were actually bursting out in all sorts of ways. And, um, the other thing we did is we used for ultra high vacuums, we used a thing called a getter iron pump. And what that did is it ionized the re re residual gas, accelerated and slammed it into a sheet of titania. And that's an actually, oh, that's I think they still use getter iron pumps well, that, that's almost to get high cool. vacuums. So, you know, titanium is really good at absorbing Oxygen oh, molecules and ions at very low pressure. Well, that's a bit like what I was just telling you about in terms of the spacecraft. That you're doing something which uh, gives the uh, effectively the oxygen atom, you know, a lot of energy to react with the titanium. I've, I've not heard of exactly how that was done. Thank well, you. Well, it developed in 1942. I just checked my firms. I'm sure we were using titanium in the lab in 1966. <laughs> um, sorry, Fred. Have we finished? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, uh, Fred, I was wondering, knowing your interest in the Stirling engine, whether you could speculate on what might have saved it. Um, and what could conceivably have happened had things been otherwise within the reasonable constraints of time um, to establish so that it could have established itself as the dominant form or with all, with all sorts of other things have stopped it? That's, that's a good, that is, that is a good question. Um, if you had had stainless steel around, 
you could have um, um, run the Stirling engine up to something like uh, with the uh, the air running at um, say something like about five five fifty six hundred C, um, approximately doubling the output, increasing the efficiency. And the interesting thing, you can start to make me think that the Stirling engine at that particular time didn't have to operate at very high pressure. So you wouldn't have required a lot of sophisticated metallurgy to have um, been, been able to do this. You could have pushed the pressure in the Stirling engine up to maybe about three or four atmospheres and the materials would have taken it. So from that engine that I was showing there, I would guess that instead of it being a 45 horsepower engine, you would have got maybe 250, 300 horsepower. Now you're really talking when you reach that kind of thing. You can't easily do that with steam, the steam cycle. If you want high efficiency from the steam cycle, you have to push up both the temperature and pressure. And this has been the real problem in developing modern superheater and boiler alloys, that you need incredible strength at something like 650 degrees in terms of long-term creep resistance. But you also have to have very good resistance to fireside corrosion and the attack from the steam on the inside. And the elements that you stick in the steel to give you the strength, to, to give you the oxidation resistance and hot corrosion resistance are inimical to high temperature strength. So I think, yes, that's a good question. The Stirling engine, we might be all here today, hailing the Stirling engine <coughs> today. Now, you've talked about high, uh, high temperature corrosion limits, but you haven't mentioned when does corrosion, what temperature does corrosion start? Because it, it, does it start? Uh, could it start at uh, very low temperatures? With mild steel, it, it begins at around about 450 degrees. Uh, by the time you've reached uh, 550, there is a problem, particularly with mild steels, is that the oxide changes from a reasonably protective form up to 550, and then thermodynamics turns it into another type of oxide called mustite, FeO, which is much is uh, much inferior to the lower temperature form. What what one is doing when one adds um, chromium to uh, steer to more steer is that you are effectively making that low temperature fairly productive, um, quite protect, protective form of oxide to be stable to much higher temperatures but with all things you reach a point whereby that material that will give up its ghost. What about mercury that's normally a liquid at room temperature, the oxide of mercury? Well, we all know that the oxide of mercury which is to produce oxygen, it's a very unstable oxide. What sort of temperature does that start? Well, you oxidise it at maybe 300 degrees. And if you then heat the red oxide of mercury at 500, that would decompose into mercury and oxygen. Yeah. You mentioned sterling engines. What stops them putting sterling engines in common vehicles so the heat, the surface heat, 
that's wasted could be then used to generate more power. Well, I think we're getting beyond the uh, subject of this meeting. I, 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 spent, uh, I spent the last um, six years of my life working on Stirling engines. And um, let me tell you what a uh, Stirling engine, what I was told by somebody who was absolutely fanatic about Stirling engines. He said, uh, how do you make a small fortune out of the Stirling engine? Yeah. And I said, start with a big one. <laughs> but he, he, was, he was a millionaire who'd been kicked out of his job because he was a Stirling engine fanatic and then started to use his computer expertise to do the stock market and that's the only time I've actually shared a room in the house of a millionaire in my existence. He was a success, he was much more successful at making money than he was at, uh, with the Stirling engine. <laughs> Any more questions? I'll shout. Um, if people were just adding, okay, um, you know, if people were adding um, chromium and things like that to their iron in, in you know the turn of the twentieth century because they didn't understand the problem and they were doing it empirically. How do we know how to do things now? Do people just take pots of nickel, steel, alloy and add random bits of cerium or something? Or is there some theory to it now? I, I, don't, I honestly don't think that in terms of oxidation, we're much further on than actually building on what we knew from experiments and um, practical experience that we got 10 years ago. Um, I have complained about this to my oxidation uh, colleagues that there isn't enough literally arithmetic going into uh, into uh, the development of uh, oxidation resistant materials. In terms of the strengthening side, this is much better done. Um, for example, in these uh, high, suit, uh, high temperature alloys that we can use um, modern thermodynamic calculations to work out the phase of the uh, phases as they're called, which will come into existence at any temperature, at least theoretically. And then we can, by playing around with them, get the right size and the right shape to give them the highest uh, strength. Now, um, if I can blow my own trumpet a bit, when I was at British Gas, as, I, as, as that uh, thing that Robert uh, was reading out, we were doing different types of high temperature corrosion to anybody else. We had to look at things in a, an unusual way. And I relied very, very heavily on the thermodynamic um, <coughs> expertise at the National Physical Laboratory to calculate um, which oxides and which sulfides and which chlorides were going to be uh, stable. And I then looked at what they were producing and tried to um, come up with some ideas on how we could best formulate these uh, uh, some new alloys. But, but I would say, uh, Robert, on the oxidation side, I still don't see really much science, as I would call it, going into it. So you need an infinite supply of PhD students, all, all kind of beavering away in their labs in the hope that they will 
make up the right mixture of, of some random process? Well, well yes, that, that is true. I mean, that the, um, the fact that uh, yttrium is found to make the aluminum scales stick on came about because people made up a load of different alloys and found that some of them were better. And when they actually did the chemical analysis, they found it was the yttri yttrium additions which had got in by accident, which were making all the difference. Any more questions? Um, Can I ask a daft question? Go, going back, going back to 1969, when uh, they landed a man on the moon and they brought him back to work and he had to come back through the atmosphere for something like 20,000 miles an hour. The capsule came back at a presumably a certain angle and it had to come down to a speed, a, a, a low speed, and then literally, say, 15 miles an hour or whatever, when it hit the earth. How did they really survive? This is no, a schoolboy school question. That, that, that was real engineering, you know. Because no, it, it went really, up to 1600 degrees or something. That, 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 was, like that. that was real engineering. They were going to, they were thought about using things like molybdenum, which has got a melting point of something like about 2700, but it's very heavy. And also, molybdenum oxidizes at a very, very high rate. And then somebody thought, well, supposing we stick a load of what is effectively tar on the front of the spacecraft, the, the, um, the heat will melt the tar, it will start bubbling, and that, the vapor will push the high temperature out of the way. And if you go to the, uh, it's that kind of idea, uh, if you go and look in the um, Science Museum, you'll see that the front of the spacecraft is ablated away. It's not relying on sophisticated intelligence. It's, it's basically something that people in the Stone Age could have thought about. Effectively, when they're picking up a pot with sticks, the, the sticks might char at the end, you know, from the fire, but keeps the heat away from the end. That's all that was being done. Nothing sophisticated. And amazing to happen, what, 50 years ago as well. Yeah. Thank you. But if there's no more questions, I'll bring this meeting to a close. I'd just like to thank Fred again for a fascinating discourse. The oxidation and high temperature corrosion is an area that I must admit personally I knew very little about. And he's shown how it links from the Stirling engine to our slight, slight almost debacle at the visit to the transporter bridge and how it's still affecting modern technology, gas cooled reactors and turbines today. So that's fascinating and, I, and, and very interesting topic for the Nuclear Society this evening. So I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. And I'd like you all to thank Frank in the usual, no, Frank Fred in the usual. Way.